Okay, uh, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me. It's uh, my great honor. Uh, and for those of you who don't know where I am, it's uh, in Tsinghua University, which is in northwestern part of Beijing. And here's sort of a map of it. it we are next to the old summer palace. And we're also next to a place called Center of the Universe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I'm affiliated with two sort of uh, uh, departments. And there's a Tsinghua version of the IS. And also there's also a department of astronomy, which is just one month old. Uh, before it was a center for astrophysics in the physics department. Uh, and, we, and also uh, very close by is the KIAA, the Kavli Institute from Peking University. And uh, all together, we have a written, uh, really decent group of people. In particular, uh, uh, this is Doug Lin, who is a visiting professor at uh, Tsinghua AES. And Chris Ormel uh, is going to join us in just a couple months. And so we have a really, uh, we're developing a strong group uh, uh, towards a strong group uh, on planet, uh, exoplanet planet formation. So I think I'm the only person in this session. Presumably, it's uh, the session for gas dynamics. So I'm, the hope is to cover the following. Uh, four topics, uh, angular momentum transport, uh, and uh, sort of as a consequence of that, uh, gas kinematics and their influence on the disk, uh, disk structure, uh, broadly defined uh, temperature structure, density structure, etc. And eventually I'm going to briefly discuss about the long-term evolution and dispersal. All right, so before we uh, really start, let's uh, talk about what's the governing piece of physics, okay, in, in, in gas dynamics. So starting from the thermodynamics, I think if you uh, naively uh, assume that well, if the disk is viscously, viscously accreting, uh, and given the typical accretion rate of say 10 to minus eight solar masses per year, uh, and you arrive, and with typical say opacity mass, et cetera, you arrive at a, uh, a mid-plane mid temperature of order say 500 K at one AU, and that goes as more or less R to the minus one. And in the meantime, the disk is heated by the star, by stellar irradiation, and the irradiation temperature is something like 300 K-ish, uh, but it decreases with radius much slower. So that means uh, the disk is, the bulk of the disk has to be irradiation dominated, so the temperature is mostly set by irradiation. That sort of makes the uh, study of gas dynamics relatively easy because you more or less know, given the distance, you more or less know what the temperature is. Uh, but the, the innermost region is likely dominated by viscous heating. This is true particularly when the temperature reaches, the, uh, say, 1,000 Kelvin, then you trigger the uh, uh, ionization of alkali species. And there, you basically, uh, the MRI must be active, and you get a lot of uh, uh, turbulence. And these turbulence generally are sufficient to generate enough heat to uh, sustain so that the, the temperature in this region where we have thermal ionization is really dominated by viscous uh, heating. But uh, uh, and exactly where this transition happens from uh, viscously heating dominated to irradiation dominated, then that really depends on the gas dynamics, say, basically beyond this uh, thermal uh, ionization region, et cetera. Uh, and in, in addition, uh, the bulk of the disk, as I said, is mostly dominated by irradiation. But in addition, there are also high energy uh, photons, X-rays, and UV. They can substantially heat the disk atmosphere so that you get a cool sort of mid-plane bulk disk, and then you get a much hotter atmosphere. So that's a very brief summary of uh, the uh, governing physics for some that determine the disk temperature. Uh, and another piece of governing physics, which I think is uh, probably uh, more important and also is very widely discussed, is how do magnetic fields and gas are coupled. And we know magnetic field uh, plays a crucial role here. Uh, so here, uh, how they are coupled, well, that has to, magnetic fields are only coupled with the charged species, so that has to do with ionization. Uh, and uh, uh, here, unless, uh, okay, besides this region where you get some thermal ionization, the bulk of the disk, again, has to rely on external sources, uh, sources of ionization here, mainly the stellar X-ray UV, and possibly some cosmic rays if they are not uh, 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 being pushed, uh, being excluded by, say, stellar or disk winds. And if you uh, take some typical uh, uh, parameters from, say, the stellar X-ray flux and cosmic ray flux, et cetera, you, and you plug into a chemistry calculation, uh, and here is the uh, ionization fraction, just look at the red line, as, as a function of height above the mid-plane. So you are talking about ionization fraction of something like 10 to minus 14 at 1 AU in the mid-plane region, and that only increases to 10 to minus uh, 8, minus 7 towards the surface. So you are talking about extremely weakly ionized system. And in this system, gas and magnetic fields are not well coupled. Uh, and how do, I how do we descri uh, describe this coupling? Uh, 
Um, so starting from the simpler, simplest case, where if you are very well coupled, if you are, the gas is well ionized, then uh, you have this very familiar result of flux freezing that's called ideal MHD. So that means if you move the fluid around, then magnetic field uh, moves, moves with it, and that's described by ideal MHD. Uh, and if uh, you're very weakly ionized, then what happens is that, okay, you have charged species, electrons, ions, and electrons are the most mobile species. And what electrons do is that they just gyrate around the magnetic field, and from time to time, it can collide with a neutral molecule. And one, after one collision, they, they sort of jump from one field line to another. So basically what happens is that field lines are frozen in the electron fluid, okay? And on top of that, uh, because of this electron neutral collision, they can, uh, um, they sort of, uh, 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 the magnetic field can sl uh, slip through these electron fluids due to these collisions. And uh, another way to freeze this, uh, and, okay, and these are described by non ideal MHD. Um, and this is probably the only equation that I'm going to show. And the way to describe this, okay, uh, this non ideal MHD effect, uh, if you just look at the induction equation, here, I okay, in the non ideal MHD regime, magnetic fields, they are only uh, frozen to the electrons. And plus that electrons can collide with the neutrals, that gives you this dissipation term, this is the resistivity. But of course, when you solve MHD equations, you're not really solving electron velocity, you, you only solve the velocity of the bulk fluid, which is basically the neutral, velocity of the neutrals. Then you play this mathematical game, this is uh, identity, you say electron velocity is the bulk fluid velocity, well, basically the neutral velocity plus electron ion drift plus ion neutral drift. And so this is the identity, and when you plug them back in, you get, uh, so this induction equation is split into, okay, now you get this more familiar inductive term, that's the ideal MHD term, then you get this three extra term, so this just copied from here, the ohmic resistivity, and then the electron ion drift gives you the Hall, uh, Hall effect, and the ion neutral drift gives you this uh, amipolar diffusion. And if you look at how, uh, and these are called non-ideal MHD terms, and if you look at how strong these terms are, uh, you figure that they are all inversely proportional to the ionization fraction, that means uh, okay, the, the weaker the ionization, the more important they are. And in addition, uh, the, you see the amipolar term is proportional to B square over rho square, and hall is proportional to B over rho, and omega is independent of B over rho. That means uh, this amipolar diffusion is gonna be important in low density regions with strong magnetic field, uh, and omega is basically the opposite limit. It, it, will, be, it will be important only uh, in the densest part of the disk. Uh, <clears throat> And another thing to notice is that this Hall term uh, has a very interesting property which is polarity dependent. And the way to understand it is again looking at this equation and you ask what happens if you change the sign of the B field, let's say if you basically flip the field. Uh, and the first thing you, you might want to check is whether the Lorentz force uh, ch uh, change, changes or not. Uh, but fortunately they, they, it's not because I mean, if you change sign J it's curl of B, so they change sign twice, the Lorentz force is not affected. But what's affected if you look at the induction equation, if you change the sign of magnetic field, uh, everything changes except the Hall term, okay? Uh, so that basically makes this term a polarity dependent term, right? So that uh, when you, uh, so depending on whether the background field is say aligned with rotation or anti-aligned with rotation, you can get different, they can affect the evolution of magnetic field differently and hence it affects the overall dynamics differently. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, and <clears throat> now we ask <coughs> uh, in disks, which regions are dominated by what effect? Uh, as I said earlier, right, ohmic resistivity is important in the densest part of the disk. That applies to the mid-plane region of the inner disk. And then as you go in, move, uh, move up, uh, as density drops, you are then dominated by the Hall effect. And as density drops further, if you move up further, you are dominated by amipolar diffusion. And eventually, uh, to the very surface layer, uh, there's a far UV can, uh, can penetrate into the disk and they can substantially boost the ionization fraction so that uh, since the ionization fraction has boosted substantially, you are basically, you bring the gas into more or less the ideal MHC regime. Uh, so that's in the inner part of the disk and if you move radially outwards, again, as density drops, the ohmic resistivity becomes unimportant. Now you are dominated by Hall in the mid plane and move up, your, then amipolar diffusion, then ideal MHD. And if you move really outward further, then you are entirely dominated by amipolar diffusion. So that's the, basically the scaling, okay, how important this, this, uh, these effects are uh, in disks. All right, so <clears throat> now let's uh, talk about uh, uh, angular momentum transport. 
uh, how, okay, there are basically two ways you can transport angular momentum. One is by uh, uh, re transporting angular momentum radially outward. I, okay, this has uh, to do with either you have some sort of viscosity, normally you don't have real molecular viscosity, so you, ne you need some kind of turbulence, and that normally is thought to be either the MRI or pure hydrodynamic turbulence. Uh, but in fact, when you have magnetic, you can also have a sort of laminar stress, which is essentially the same as magnetic breaking. That can also transport angular momentum readily outward. Uh, <clears throat> alternatively, you can transport angular momentum vertically and by a magnetized disk wind. This requires some large-scale magnetic field threading the disk. And as the disk rota rotates and it's differentially rotating, you can wind up magnetic field into uh, this helical configuration that you build up magnetic pressure and then that can push things out. And in the meantime, magnetic, field, magnetic fields don't want to be winded, they want to straighten, okay? So when you wind them up, they try to resist, and when they resist, they extract angular momentum from the disk. Okay, so, so in the meantime, as you launch the wind, the wind also ex extracts disk angular momentum. Uh, <coughs> and uh, for this, okay, you, we see, this, see that in both cases in general, you, you, you need some sort of uh, magnetic fields, okay? But here, uh, for this case, MHC mechanisms are sensitive to ionization. Okay, you have to do with how well they are coupled. Um, the hydro hydrodynamics uh, uh, mechanisms are also uh, widely discussed, and uh, they are found to be very sensitive to, to thermodynamics. And uh, for MHC wind, uh, the wind properties, okay, um, these are also uh, widely studied, but they are found that the wind properties are sensitive to disk physics. So in either case, we really need to uh, uh, have a realistic understanding of the disk physics before we can understand angular momentum transport. All right, and here's because there have been so many works already, and so I just give a very quick summary of what people have done. Okay, so in the, back in the 1970s, the viscous accretion theory was uh, sort of developed. Though at those times, they're not, not motivated by protoplanetary disks, but by X ray binaries. Um, and then in the yeah, but at that time, it is well known that, okay, okay if you have viscosity things, Everything works, but where is the source of viscosity? That, that was unclear. Um, in the 80s, the theory of MHC wind was developed uh, and was sort of very popular at that time because people don't know what the source of resistivity, but this, you have a working model, which is this wind. And then in the 90s, uh, the first thing is the MRI was rediscovered, and then immediately, while well, people find the source of viscosity, then there is a sort of paradigm shift. People now all work on MRI. Um, and uh, in the context of protoplanetary disks, uh, GAMI proposed this layered accretion model, and those are mostly based on the, okay, you, there are three non MHD effects, they are all well recognized, but at that time, mostly people only considered resistivity, uh, and so those are all in this regime of layered accretion because resistivity only in the inner region of the midpoint region of the inner disk. So the inner disk is layered accretion, outer disk, people thought it's all, it's all MRI turbulence. Uh, wind theories are continu were continuously de developed, but w at a slower pace because more people are working on MRI-related stuff. Uh, and then, uh, in the 20, uh, basically this dec in the past decade, uh, how effect and MA polar diffusion become better understood, th mainly thanks to uh, simulations. Okay, when people can start to understand the nonlinear out outcome of the MRI in the presence of how effect and MA polar diffusion, and the main Result is that well, people find that in the inner disk MRI is completely suppressed, and you have to rely on wind-driven accretion to drive angular momentum transport. And so the wind-driven wind picture scenario is revived. Uh, and in the meantime, several hydrodynamic instabilities are identified. So there's also a resurgence of studies of hydro turbulence, uh, and there's a nice review uh, very recently by Vlad and uh, this Umarhan. Uh, and also in the meantime. Uh, Due to thanks to the uh, computational development, people now are able to run global simulations that include all three nine MHD effects. And so, based on all this, okay, here is a very sort of my own personal sort of a little biased summary of what uh, our current understanding is. So, this region uh, we have thermal ionization we expect to be fully MRI, uh, MRI turbulent, and then um, in this bulk inner region. Um, Thanks to all these non-ideal MHD effects, uh, MRI is suppressed, and you have to you have this MHD wind uh, because of the Hall effect important in this region. So the property of the gas kinematics depends on the polarity of the large-scale magnetic field. Okay, and in the outer region, 
it's only ambipolar diffusion. Ambipolar diffusion is, should be sufficient to damp uh, MHC, but not ne necessarily fully suppress it. Uh, so you expect some damped turbulence. Uh, and then also there's a surface layer that if FUV is able to penetrate into the surface, that may uh, give some uh, stronger tur turbulence uh, toward the surface. So that's the sort of current understanding. And uh, <coughs> here I'm showing you the recent uh, global simulation that include all three non-ideal MHD effects. And uh, of course, things, things depend on the uh, polarity. So I'm starting with the aligned case where background field is aligned with rotation. Okay, so I have three panels, density, mass flux, and magnetic field. The first thing that you may notice is that the field get amplified. This is a, the color is toroidal field. Uh, and this is due to the so-called Hall shear instability that has been also discussed in the literature, uh, which is, happens in this aligned case that strongly amplifies the horizontal component of the magnetic field. Uh, because this region, Hall, Hall effect is stronger than toward the outer region. So here, the, the B5 is amplified so much that it actually occupies the entire disk. Okay, but on the other hand, to get the right wind geometry, B5 must change sign. So it has to change sign somewhere. So in this case, it changes sign in the surface. But toward the outer disk, because Hall effect is weaker, they are able to change sign, sort of getting a more symmetric configuration. They change sign in the midpoint region. <coughs> um, and then more interesting, if you look uh, from there, if you, if you to look at the uh, mass flux, clearly you can see here, red means mass is moving out, blue is moving in. And you see that in this region, you have sort of half of the mass moving out, half moving in. Okay, in this region, you get all the accretion flow in the midplane, and but you get above and below, you get mass flowing out. And why is that? Uh, this is entirely due to the magnetic field configuration uh, you get from the third panel. And the way to understand it <coughs> is that, okay, so you have rate of angular momentum loss equals the torque, and the torque is from the Lorentz force. <coughs> okay, and here's the rate of angular momentum loss, the specific angular momentum, the differentially, and the, times the, uh, the equation velocity. And on the right hand is the torque. Torque is from Lorentz force, okay, and here, here it, the Z component, okay, of the F over F cross R, right, the torque. Uh, and that has to do with the phi component of the Lorentz force. And if you go through all this, you find that it's basically the, uh, depends on the vertical gradient of B phi, okay. So that gives you the J, J cross B, okay, the, is the Lorentz force. So it's, it's this one and times BZ, that's the dominant component. And if, when you, uh, <coughs> uh, when you're uh, equating this two, you find that basically this VR, the equation velocity is proportional to the vertical gradient of B phi, okay? Okay, and BZ, uh, if the disk is thin, BZ is more or less constant. And so now if you look at here, right? Uh, in, in this region, B phi maximizes at the midplane, right? So the gradient of B phi changes sign across the midplane. So that's why this the direction of the equation flow changes sign here. Uh, and in this region, uh, B phi, uh, is a, the gradient is strongest here, and it changes sign in the direction such that you get accretion flow. And then B phi increases and decreases, so you get, uh, the first increase is you get the accretion flow region, and then decreases you get the outflow region. So that's how you can uh, sort of understand this complex flow structure. Uh, <coughs> and actually this complex flow structure may have some implications on uh, dust transport, right? Like in this region, if the dust is just doing, uh, doing some vertical oscillation, you have some turbulence, but if it's upper half, uh, the gas just uh, carries the, the, the dust outward, and in the lower half, the gas carries the, the, the dust inward. Uh, we find that in this case, uh, this complex flow structure more or less acts like diffusion. Okay, so it just uh, give us a little bit of diff extra diffusion that's, uh, that will mimic this effect. But in this region, it's actually more interesting because uh, most, the dust spend more time near the midplane region, so that this will actually give you uh, some accelerated radio drift. So the dashed line is, you, if, is that if you don't consider this complex flow structure, you get uh, uh, dust evolution that behave like this, uh, this dashed line. But if you can take into account this complex flow structure, you get a much faster drift, okay? Uh, <clears throat> all right, okay, that's the aligned case. And here, another simulation is the anti-aligned case, uh, where uh, net field is anti-parallel with uh, omega. Uh, and in this case, everything works the opposite way. Instead of Hall shear instability that amplify the field, then they try to reduce the field, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but it turns out this configuration is a little unstable, and eventually you end up with a highly asymmetric configuration where B phi uh, changes sign at the very 
disk surface. And whenever B5 changes sign, uh, you get a very strong accretion flow. And that accretion flow is, is exactly as meet uh, disk surface. And that's one-sided asymmetric. Uh, and in fact, it's, uh, actually, we find the accretion velocity is supersonic. Uh, <clears throat> so you get all so, sort of uh, this kind of behavior. And, but they are all understandable once you understand the magnetic field evolution. All right, uh, the next topic is uh, about the level of turbulence. And uh, as I mentioned before, Ed, we expect the, uh, um, well, in terms of observations, you can only probe the, the outer region. And in the outer region, the expectation is that you have damped uh, turbulence in the midplane, uh, and a surface layer, you may get some MRI. Uh, however, observations tend to show that uh, <coughs> this is for HD163296 uh, from uh, Flaherty et, et al. And, uh, People tend to find that, okay, anywhere, okay, they are using because different, uh, uh, different lines. Different lines have different optical depths so that they can probe different uh, vertical heights. But looks like uh, at all region, uh, you only get upper limit, and very stringent upper limit, well be below uh, uh, 0 0.1 uh, sound speed. And the same seems to be true uh, on the other disk, TW Hydra. <coughs> uh, and uh, this work led by uh, Jake Simon and uh, in order to reconcile this result, we, uh, we find that we really need uh, uh, somewhat weaker field, and also we need to reduce the ionization level. Okay? And, and how to reduce ionization level there, uh, <coughs> uh, either when cosmic, cosmic rays are excluded and X-rays may be uh, shielded from the wind launched from the inner region, there are some ideas, but this needs to be tested. Um, <coughs> all right, now moving to the uh, discussion of uh, pure hydrodynamic instability. Since this is a review talk, I'm just briefly covering this, but I, I believe the, there are people in the, ex, in, in the audience that know uh, much better than I do. Uh, the, there are three uh, major uh, hydrodynamic instabilities that have been uh, intensely discussed in the recent literature. One is the vertical shear instability, uh, which is natural in disk because the disk naturally has a vertical shear in the uh, uh, azimuthal velocity. And whenever you have that, as well as fast cooling, okay, you would, uh, this vertical shear instability uh, will, will turn on. And then there's also the subcritic uh, baroclinic instability, which subcritical means uh, it's nonlinear, but there's also a linear version called convective overstability. Uh, they operate on similar mechanisms. And this basically requires a negative radial gradient, so it's like a, a convection, radial convection. Uh, <coughs> But of course, it requires some assist from uh, thermal relaxation. If it's a purely adiabatic, this won't work. You need some uh, thermal relaxation to allow some heat exchanges for it to, for it to operate. And uh, then there's a more exotic the zombie vortex instability. It's also a nonlinear instability uh, and needs some uh, seed uh, vorte vortex to operate. Uh, and, but this one needs nearly adiabatic conditions. And here, this, uh, this is a review. Uh, uh, recent review by uh, Vlad and uh, Uferman, um, <clears throat> showing the possible regions uh, of where these instabilities may, uh, may show up. And uh, so since this one requires highly uh, adiabatic conditions, so th this may reside in regions with highest optical depths. And vertical shear instability may operate in the outer part of the disk. And if you manage to set up a radial pressure gradient, uh, sorry, radial entropy gradient, then you may have convective uh, instabilities in between. And these different instabilities have, have different uh, properties. This VSI have primarily show this vertical, pronounced vertical uh, uh, velocity fluctuations. And the baroclinic or the over, convective overstability showing a, a lot of uh, big vort vortices. Uh, no, well, not big, actually small uh, vortices. And this is ZVI, the zombie vortex instability, also start with some vortex but later on, it can evolve into this kind of so-called zonal flows. Uh, <clears throat> but nevertheless, all these instabilities seem to, okay, they all seem to transport angular momentum, but at only at modest level, typically uh, with uh, alpha values less than about 10 to minus three. Uh, <clears throat> well, the next question, a natural question to ask is whether they uh, <coughs> survive. Okay, so these are all mostly discussed in the context of pure hydro, okay. Then the question is whether, okay, if you have MHC wind, there's magnetic field and there's some coupling between gas and magne magnetic fields, whether these instabilities uh, still operate. Uh, so we start to look at this problem. We just pick up uh, VSI uh, and we'll try to study the interplay between uh, VSI and magnetic fields. Uh, 
And there has been one study uh, on the linear uh, stability of uh, the system where, okay, people find that if you have MRI, basically peop uh, VSI uh, is suppressed. But of course, if MRI is not suppressed, and we're just trying to see what happens, uh, and uh, so this is simulation. We are setting the cooling time to be zero, which is ideal for, for VSI. And clearly, it launches this wind, but in the meantime, you can see this is a V theta, or basically a VZ, and clearly you develop uh, this very characteristic uh, VSI patterns, and then it perturbs the disk, but the wind and this VSI can definitely uh, coexist. Uh, <coughs> and uh, we also played with different field strengths, and we, uh, and when field strength is weak, you, the, the property of the VSI is basically the same as pure hydro simulations. But when the field uh, gets stronger, uh, it basically modifies the vertical shear profile, and then the, the, the properties are slightly different. All right. <coughs> um, now I'm gonna move to about the uh, kinematics of the wind. Um, as uh, Kathy has already given a very nice uh, review on the so-called photo evaporation, and the photo evaporation is based on the idea that if there's no magnetic field and then the disk surface is heavily heated by the high energy radiation so that you can launch an oscillator, the, the, the gas becomes unbound. And there are three flavors, UV, far UV, uh, X-rays, and far UV and X-rays can typically give you a significant mass loss and there's also the, uh, another flavor of external photo evaporation. Uh, but in the meantime, if you have magnetic fields, this has, well, this is the sort of the development of MHD wind over the past several, uh, 20 ish years. Uh, but mostly, when people talk about MHD wind, people talk about cold MHD wind. That's also mostly what simulations, uh, their parameters are, are tuned for. And this kind of wind, typically, they require strong vertical field. And actually, if you use that parameter space, you find that the wind is way too strong for a proto you, uh, you, you will basically lose your disk in, say, a thousand years instead of uh, a few million years. Uh, and because you have such strong uh, field, the wind is typically in the centrifugal regime. You're the, the magnetic field, line, field lines are very steep and so, th so that uh, anything uh, on, the, on the gas will be uh, flung out by the centrifugal force. Um, but I would say, really, uh, we sh these two things should not really exclude each other. We really need to marry uh, photo evaporation with MHD. And so that's uh, what we're, we, tried, we proposed, a uh, sort of unified picture where, yes, you are using, you, okay, uh, you have MHD wind, which drives the creation. Photo evaporation doesn't transport anything, it doesn't drive the creation. You have MHD wind, but because the wind is heated, okay, this region is heated, so the wind is hot wind, it's not a cold wind. Uh, and the level of heating may likely affect uh, the, the, the gas kinematics. And here is some sort of a semi-analytical model. And here I'm just showing uh, the two main parameters uh, uh, in that simple model is the magnetic field strength and how much <coughs> far UV are, is able to penetrate. And we find that, okay, if you increase magnetic field strength, wind-driven accretion rate increases. Uh, and wind mass loss rate also increases, but it increases more slowly. On the other hand, if you say increase the far UV, it's here it's just parameterized by far UV penetration depth, uh, wind driven accretion rate increases and mass loss rate also increases, but it increases uh, a lot faster. So basically both uh, magnetic field strength and thermal effects matter. And so we call this magnetothermal wind as a purpose that we just try to marriage the two processes. And we also find that the, disk, um, the mass loss rate uh, from this wind is actually fairly significant. It's, about, it's comparable to the wind-driven accretion rate. Uh, <clears throat> and also, and in this case, a wind driving mechanism is not a centrifugal, it's not magnetocentrifugal uh, wind that people uh, usually talk about. It's mainly the wind is driven by a magnetic pressure gradient. All right, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, and, uh, but of course, because uh, the wind depend, uh, sensitively depend on thermodynamics, right? You really need to get the thermodynamics right uh, in order to get realistic wind properties. So, um, but to get the thermodynamic right, you need to get the cooling right. To get the cooling right, you have to get the right coolant, so you have to get the right chemistry. And this is the work led by Li Le Wang, uh, and where he was able to implement time-dependent chemistry, which is quite impressive, uh, and couple that with MHD. And you get very nice uh, uh, wind launching, and everything is self-consistent, because the thermodynamics is uh, self-consistently uh, computed. Uh, and here, uh, I think Jeremy is, is likely talking more, uh, gonna talk more about this work. But just to show that here you get, uh, so uh, this, this is a mass uh, wind-driven accretion rate and mass loss rate as a function of radius. Uh, 
So you get the right accretion rate of about 10 to minus eight supermass per year, and the wind mass loss rate is actually also significant. It's about comparable uh, to the um, to the wind driven accretion rate. And moreover, uh, Dealer has found that EUV actually can be important, uh, and also wind heating. Uh, is actually dominated by ambipolar diffusion because the wind is not completely ideal MHD. There's also some ion neutral friction which heats the wind. Uh, and in fact, in terms of chemistry, right, in order to, to make this calculation possible, you cannot really use a very complex chemical reaction network like the astrochemistry people really use. And so to make this possible, you really need a reduced chemical network. Otherwise, it's hopeless. Uh, and so we are. Uh, with this, uh, Rui Xu, uh, who is uh, currently a student in Princeton, we uh, made a, an attempt to do this. And you, you are not able, supposed to read all these, but basically we are able to uh, reduce uh, a chemical reaction network from, say, several uh, hundreds of species, several thousand reactions to, okay, uh, about 30 gas phase species and 60 gas phase reactions. Uh, and that they can reasonably reproduce as a resu result from much complex chemistry. But this only works either in the mid-plane region, say within plus minus two scale height, or in the disk atmosphere, which is penetrated by UV. Uh, the intermediate region turns out to be very complex, where you have rich molecular chemistry, uh, and, uh, and those you seem to need about uh, 100 each species, which uh, that's probably the major difficulty uh, if you really want to couple chemistry with dynamics uh, throughout the entire region. All right, um, another aspect on disk structure. Um, uh, because, well, uh, substructures are now seem ubiquitous, uh, seems to be ubiquitous in, in disks, right? And there is a natural debate whether the substructures are caused by planets or they are planet-free mechanisms. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, they are not necessarily uh, planet-free. But in the lit okay, but people do have uh, discussed several possible mechanisms that magnetic induce uh, magnetic field can induce uh, these substructures, and one of them is the so-called zonal flows, which is found that okay, so this is the time evolution of a local shearing box simulation, and uh, uh, this is time, and this is the, basically the radial direction, and you can see uh, what's plotted here is the mid-plane density, and you can see as time uh, evolves it automatically, spontaneously develops into this uh, banded structure. There's a density variation, they eventually merge into one, a uh, big uh, a sort of density uh, bump plus a, a, a cross. Uh, and it, what's more interesting is that if you look at the uh, time evolution of magnetic flux, you see that magnetic flux are, get concentrated uh, in, this, uh, <coughs> uh, in, in this gap regions. Um, and uh, in, just uh, last week or so, I think there's a paper showing that this is actually likely a wind instability. Um, basically, if you have a, a slight more concentration of magnetic flux here, you tend to drive a stronger wind, and then you deplete this region more, okay? Uh, or, and also, you transport angular momentum a bit more, so that also helps it deplete this region. So this is one possibility. And another uh, possibility uh, is uh, it's work by uh, Suriano et al. And also there's discussions uh, by uh, Bessun et al. Uh, basically, you have, uh, these are mostly ambipolar diffusion dominated disks. And uh, there's, uh, um, they found that a mechanism where, okay, where you have this uh, wind driven accretion in ambipolar diffusion dominated regime, you have accretion flow mostly concentrated in the mid plane. And that accretion flow uh, drags magnetic flux and uh, and at some point they reconnect, and after they reconnect, you get a region devoid of magnetic flux, and that becomes a density bump. And in between, you have uh, all this magnetic flux, which tries to, tries to deplete this re this region. But uh, empirically, this only seems to work uh, when you are modestly strongly magnetized uh, with vertical plasma beta less than a thousand or so. Uh, these are actually fairly strong fields. Uh, in typical MHD simulation, we have plasma vertical plasma beta of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5. So this would be on the stronger side. Uh, and there's also recent work by uh, Xiao Hu, who is also here uh, at all. And they found that well, if we, uh, <coughs> instead of having a uniform prescription of the ambipolar diffusion coefficient, uh, what if, say, the, uh, um, say the dust distribution is, uh, there was the result of uh, uh, sintering when HL tau result was coming out. There were multiple explanations. One of these 
if the scintoid result nearly, uh, basically near the snow lines, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the dust become, the dust, uh, it, they tend to produce more smaller dust particles due to scintoid because the dust property become more, uh, more likely to, to fragment. And so you get a smaller, um, uh, a stronger non-IDMHC effect near the uh, snow lines. And when you plug that in, they seem to find, okay, you tend to pr also produce substructures near here uh, are the two major snow lines that they included in the model. So all of these are all, they're not necessarily conclusions, but these are all the possibilities that uh, are currently available uh, in the market. All right, there are also, um, the next talk is about the uh, temperature structure. Uh, uh, usually people do this in two, either two, uh, two ways. Um, in the post-processing manner, uh, you just say, okay, we can run very complex models with the relative transfer and possibly uh, thermal chemistry as well, everything is included uh, in a static disk model. And you can also possibly add viscous heating, assuming everything is viscous. Uh, and here you get some temperature profile. There's the surface layer that's very hot. Uh, and the mid-plane region, if, if you include viscous heating, you can get a mid-plane region that is hotter than the, uh, than the intermediate layer and then eventually surface you get uh, superheated. Uh, there are also um, uh, relative radiation MHD simulations. Uh, usually they're either fully in the ideal MHD regime or uh, include some resistivity uh, in the midpoint region for the, for the dead zone. Um, those you can get the, uh, the temperature sort of uh, the, uh, viscous heating. If you have, have some viscous heating, you get some little bump here. Otherwise it's more or less flat and then they, 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 they raise up. Um, <coughs> And uh, well, the nice thing about this is that you take into account uh, the, the uh, turbulent dissipation profile. Uh, although in this particular model, the turbulent dissipation doesn't seem to be, well, it seems to raise the mid-plane temperature by a certain amount if you have some turbulent, uh, turbulent dissipation. But now, uh, if we are in this, uh, uh, okay, pure wind-driven uh, wind accretion scenario um, with, uh, um, with no turbulence, then you have no turbulent dissipation and instead, you will have some Joule dissipation. Okay, we have resistivity, it's just a J cross, J dot E. And uh, then we did a calculation with Shoji Mori uh, at Tokyo Tech, uh, where we included Joule dissipation, and we see what happens. And we find that Joule dissipation is very ineffective. And so that basically the bulk disk temperature uh, is almost entirely determined by irradiation, okay? And instead, if we include alpha disk model with alpha, relatively large alpha, you get, okay, you get a mid-plane temperature bump. But since we don't have that, okay, in reality, you just have geo dissipation, then uh, we find that mostly the disk uh, temperature is, uh, is entirely determi determined by irradiation, and that's generally cooler than what people usually assume. All right, I'm almost running out of time, but I still have one important topic, which is on the long-term evolution. Uh, because all the, uh, um, what I've talked about relies on the fact that you have some large scale magnetic field flux penetrating into the disk, okay? Then the question is where that magnetic flux is coming from and where, is it, where does it go, okay? And this lies into the problem of, uh, falls into the problem of magnetic flux transport and conventionally that's understood uh, as a balance between accretion which try to advex magnetic flux inward and then if you have dissipation, either turbulence or resistivity that tend to uh, diffuse magnetic flux outward, and whether you get flux transport flux in or out depends on which of the effect wins. Uh, but now um, we don't have much turbulence, and also we have other non-IDMC effects. So the question is whether which direction okay does magnetic flux move? Uh, so we earlier we did some numerical ex experiments. Uh, these are applicable for the outer region of the disk, but you still inc include the Hall effect. Uh, and in both cases, we find that magnetic flux, you, uh, they, in both cases, they all move out, okay? It's just in, in this case, I think it moves out faster than, than, than this one. And if you combine all the results <coughs> together, we find that uh, in all cases, you move magnetic flux out, and the, the more strongly magnetized, uh, the more rapidly you are losing magnetic flux. So in terms of time evolution, you are, overall, you are losing magnetic flux, and you are initially, you are likely to be more strongly magnetized, here, uh, and you also lose magnetic flux faster, okay, so that you evolve towards this region, then you get more weakly magnetized, you're also losing flux, but you're losing more slowly, okay, so that's uh, sort of, uh, uh, I would say, consistent 
with the fact that when you are your early, say, class zero, class one phase, you are uh, very rapidly accreting, but these phases are also relatively short-lived, okay? And then the later phases, class two, uh, you, you are less magnetized, but you are also losing flux slowly, uh, more slower, and so you are uh, more likely to be long-lived. Uh, <clears throat> but there's another complication because all the disks have an outer boundary. They are, they are truncated. So that now recently we are um, working with my postdoc, Hai Feng Yang, we are running simulations with the outer truncation. And interestingly, we find that, okay, you are actually not really losing magnetic, you are reconnecting magnetic flux. So magnetic flux, they, they first they, they bend, okay, then they close somewhere there, and then you form a loop, and this loop gradually shrinks, okay? So that's probably how magnetic flux, flux is get dissipated, okay, in disks. Uh, all right, I'm just to finally briefly mention that uh, we don't have much magnetic observations on magnetic field because I think the only one that's currently uh, 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 published is uh, this uh, upper limit from the Zeeman splitting by Vlamins et al. for the TW hydro disk. Uh, but this, the result can be debatable because there are systematics that may be underestimated. Uh, but the, the more reliable measurement, I would say, is probably coming from the solar nebula, uh, uh, paleomagnetism. Basically, they are just studying magnetized uh, meteorites. And uh, you have to find the right sample. They are very pristine, and they, well, they are well preserved so that they may have the nebula conditions. Here's a compilation of currently, uh, currently uh, measured uh, uh, paleomagnetic samples. Um, and the, also, the, the nice thing is that you have, uh, you have age, radioactive ages, right? So you, at about, uh, one to two, uh, about two million years after CI formation, that's roughly the age okay, of uh, the time zero of the solar system, you get a very relatively stronger magnetic field here. And over time, it seems to be decaying, and eventually you only get upper limits. Uh, and uh, if you can compare the, uh, the measured field strength with the expected field strength, okay, uh, basically the stronger the field, is, the higher the accretion rate is, so that the expected field strength is parameter parameterized as a function of, of accretion rate. And here different lines are for different sort of mechanisms. And more or less, I would say they are all sort of comparable with, uh, compatible with the expect expected accretion rate of about 10 to minus 8 solar masses per year. So, so far, this seems to uh, match reasonably well. All right, so let me summarize. Um, so, uh, angular momentum transport uh, in disk is likely wind-dominated and with possible contribution from uh, hydrodynamic instabilities. The flow structure can be complex and depend on the polarity of the, uh, uh, the large-scale B-field. Uh, the disk wind is magnetothermal in nature uh, with significant mass loss comparable to accretion rate. Um, this might yield ring-like substructures, but it's, of course, debatable, uh, but, and with very little heating, okay? The Joule heating is very inefficient. The long-term disk evolution is likely governed by the transport of magnetic flux, and which uh, <coughs> they are transported outward, and magnetic flux get dissipated over time. Um, since this is the talk on computation, I have really, haven't really talked anything about computation, but here are the necessary, I think I would say, here are the necessary ingredients that we would love to include uh, in model 9 MHD, uh, radiation, uh, especially important in inner disk and also in the early phases of disk where it's highly optically thick, uh, self-gravity, chemistry, uh, and particles coagulation. I would say so far, hardly more than two of the above have been included. Uh, <clears throat> and so that also means that there's a lot to be done. I'll stop here, thank you. Questions, Jake. Um, yeah, so I just wanted, wondered if uh, how many of these simulations were 2D versus 3D, and can you speculate on if anything would change in 3D? Uh, all the simulations I showed are, are 2D. Mm -hmm. um, um, so one thing is that in uh, once you form this current sheet, I'm not sure whether they are stable, and that has to be examined in 3D. But 3D simulations do exist. Uh, well, actually, for, for the ring simulations that I mentioned, um, I think both uh, Xiao simulation and Suriano simulation, they, they all went to 3D. Um, although, I would say the resolution, I think their resolution is very poor in 3D. Uh, 
uh, short resolution with uh, mesh refinement is uh, uh, is okay. Um, but I think they find consistent results between 2D and 3D. Yeah. Kathy? About the outer uh, extent of your wind-driven uh, region, I, I noticed a lot of your, your calculations are going out to about 50 AU, and you uh -huh. mentioned an amplipolar diffusion-dominated uh, region beyond there. Um, just given that most of the mass in the disk is at large radius, how far out can you get this mechanism to work? Uh, well, the... Uh, Let's see. Yeah, like this simulation, I mean, the disk goes to infinity, basically. It goes all the way to the outer boundary. There's no truncation. And I, I couldn't manage to get the simulation uh, because, like say, you have one rotation at r equals 100. That means 1,000 rotations at r equals 1. And I couldn't uh, afford to run that too long. And so at least I would say up to this radius, I'm very comfortable, OK? Yeah. <coughs> So uh, why the, the flow that is created by the whole gear instability is not affecting the density perturbations when you have the BSI? When you, when you show this slide where the, the winds does not affect, in principle, the BSI. Oh, the BSI, OK. But then when you have the whole gear instability, you are producing <laughs> these asymmetric flows at the midplane. Why the, that is not affecting the density perturbations? OK, so for this simulation, I, ha I, I didn't include Hall. It's pure amipolar diffusion. Uh, and I, I would also call this a, a, a numerical experiment. We're actually playing some tricks that we are making sure that we are in a re reasonably clean environment. You have a pure amipolar diffusion dominated regime with, uh, with a laminar wind, and then you see uh, whether uh, VSI can develop. But of course, yeah, eventually we, we need to do more realistic simulations. Yes. Just take one, one more question. Case. It, uh -huh. it looked like there was um, kind of turbulent uh, yeah. VRs in the center. Is that just an artifact of a different state? <laughs> you mean state? what you mean? This region is yeah, is yeah. Is that um, is that normal turbulence? Yeah, this is something that I need to go to 3D to better verify. Mm. Um, I think there, I think Jake also had some local simulation that in this anti-aligned uh, uh, case you get some some turbulence. Yeah. And, it, and it's stronger than in the aligned case. The, the fluctuation is not turbulent. The fluctuation, yes, because the aligned case is basically yeah, laminar. Yeah. OK, yeah. OK. Uh. Um, did you mention the, uh, the, the concept of a whole dichotomy at any point in the Say again? Hall a like whole dichotomy. I mean, there was an idea bouncing dichotomy. around that, that maybe oh, there's yeah. totally <laughs> different types of disks out there. Right. Um, that we should be finding. Yes, Whatever I should have mentioned that, that. yes. I w the, yeah, I haven't mentioned anything related to gravity. I think Kathy already did a great job. I haven't mentioned, uh, but those are relatively in the I very early stages. And uh, yes, in, in, in terms of initial conditions, where which Pew uh, also mentioned. Oh, so you're uh, thinking of that in terms I, I haven't of talked anything about initial conditions. conditions. Yeah, that's another important okay. topic. I was, I was thinking, uh, but, I mean, but yes. the idea that dis there might be yeah. two of evolved disks, there might be ones that had anti aligned and anti-aligned that would behave very differently in observations. Yeah, and that's entirely possible, yes. They, they, okay. they, are, they, they are maybe they are not born equal, right? Uh, that's also entirely possible. Okay. Yeah. I think we, we should probably stop now because there's lunch outside. So we'll see people are smiling at that, yeah. Uh, so we'll uh, stop there and uh, thanks evening again. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.